everybody, I'm excited to be here at, what is it, the big data, biomedicine, digital health. We're just throwing like chat bots and drones that could be like leading off the buzzword section. Uh, so I'm Blake Byers, I'm a partner at Google Ventures. Um, we're kind of weird as a firm in that all of our money comes from Google, that's where we get all of our cash from, uh, but we're non-strategic to Google. So we invest in companies that are competitive, collaborative, irrelevant to Google's business interests. And we do that across a broad range of industries, including consumer companies like Uber and life science and healthcare companies like Grail that's doing deep sequencing for a pan-cancer diagnostic, Flatiron Health, Transcriptic. Um, to give you a sense of the snapshot of, uh, of how we distribute those dollars, Last year, 31% of our fund went into healthcare and life sciences. It was by far our biggest category. So while a lot of other firms are retreating, we're kind of doubling down on, on the space. And we do everything from primary care delivery, diagnostics, devices, health IT, uh, and drug discovery. So I call that a broad range of interest, but you could also call it tasteless. Um, but, uh, but there's something that kind of ties all those investments together. And, uh, and that is a focus on improving, improving outcomes. So I think it's, it's especially important to note in digital health, and I didn't think I'd have to write it down, but, uh, but just the number of times it comes up, I have to do it. Like healthcare equals improving people's health. Uh, and I think it's easier to remember when you're developing a drug and your endpoints are very specific outcomes for people. And sometimes we get lost a little bit in the digital health world, focusing on engagement numbers, distribution, revenue, working with payers, providers, insurance companies. Uh, and we forget that at the end of the day, if you're not improving people's health, you probably don't belong in healthcare. Um, and so if you think about a company that has an interesting distribution model or interesting revenue model, but you're not actually affecting outcomes, you have to ask yourself what, what the point of the company is. And that includes think, saying things like, oh, well, um, working on a digital health company, I'm really glad I don't have to run, I don't have the risk of a clinical trial. Uh, and that always is kind of shocking because a clinical trial is only really risky if your product doesn't work, right? Like that's the core risk to a clinical trial. As long as, it, yeah, there's some operating risk, but that's mainly what you're up against. Um, so when I hear that you're glad that you don't have to run a clinical trial, it's like, oh, you kind of, it's because you're, because you know your thing doesn't have that big of an effect on patients. Um, so, I kind of was thinking about three different areas within the scope of digital health uh, that we're focusing on right now. This is by no means an exhaustive list. It's more of the list I wrote last night as I was putting the presentation together. Uh, and so the first is electronic health records are health gold mines. Second is drug discovery acceleration. Uh, and the third is reimagining healthcare's interface. So what do I mean by the first category? Uh, it's really easy to search through all of my personal information. I have all my structured email that I can easily search through. And now I can even search through unstructured information like my images. So as an older brother, my number one goal is always to embarrass my younger brother. So I can easily search for his name, an owl, and I can find a weird looking photo of him and an owl and use it at a conference. And do it, do it all within seconds while I have to prepare for the presentation. Perfect. Uh, how does that relate to, to health data? Well, it's very similar in this type of unstructured information. So one of our portfolio companies, Flatiron Health, Notice in 2012 that, and, and the kind of the founders of this company came from an ad tech background. No idea about healthcare, how medicine worked at all, but they saw that only 3% of cancer patients are enrolled in a clinical trial. That means 97% are not represented in any of those data sets when we learn on top of their outcomes, what adjuvant therapies they're having, what their imaging data sets look like. Uh, it's sitting there literally as a record system for that patient, but not really used in any aggregated way. Uh, so the first thing they do is they go and integrate uh, that's hard, but it's not the hardest part. The hardest part is actually structuring all this. This is a, a KRAS report. You might think it should be really easy to pull out, but it's stored as a PDF in the EHR. Uh, and then they structure it all, and here's an example of the amount of information that was structured before uh, and then after they do an integration. Uh, and that allows you now to learn on top of that data set for developing different ontologies, developing physician assistance protocols, uh, and developing tool sets for both providers, insurance companies, and drug discovery companies. Uh, but the limit is not just in what Flatiron has done, and they've been tremendously successful in just a short period of time with that kind of heuristic of improving outcomes by using EHR data. They've raised over $300 million. They've integrated with over 2,000 providers. They've done deep deals with drug development companies like Roche and diagnostic companies like Flatiron Health. Uh, but there's a broader landscape. That's just within one sector of oncology. There's the ability to access, organize, learn on top of EHR data. There's other physician assistance tools making physicians even better at their own job, um, something that 
I think EHR systems probably do the opposite of if you, ha if you go and ask most physicians right now. Uh, there's improving the patient experience. You can imagine from a patient's perspective, if you're about to go through chronic care, what can you expect in the next three, six, nine months? Often patients are left just Googling the general protocol. If you knew what their treatment uh, plan was and you had those kind of streamlined walkthroughs available for them, you could pull straight from the HR and, and give them some sense of confidence of what's going to happen over the next, what to expect over the next few months. Or diagnostic feedback. It's still kind of remarkable to us that in the digital world where you're constantly feeding back user experience and user outcomes into your product, prognostic indicators and diagnostics don't have that benefit in the healthcare world. You don't know what the outcome of that patient was that got your diagnostic report, unless you happen to be running a clinical trial. Uh, you don't even know if the physician read the report. Uh, there's, no, there's no feedback at all. So there's lots of opportunity in both integrating and structuring that EHR data. Uh, and the reason these are all like kind of high level concepts is because if they're lower level, we'd probably already be doing it. So uh, always looking for like entrepreneurs to teach, teach us something about it. The second is drug discovery acceleration uh, and Example here is, is within the digital world at Google when engineers are deploying a new neural network to identify cats and YouTube videos. They don't go and resolder the circuit boards every time themselves. They use distributed CPU and GPU clusters uh, across the world. Uh, but in healthcare, in a lot of research, we still are kind of doing things ourselves by hand. So actually, if you Go to Urban Dictionary, look up the top definition of a graduate student. A grad student performs all the dull parts of research professors don't want to do. And it's funny because it's sad and true. Um, and, and so one of our portfolio companies was like, well, how can we massively leverage some of our smartest friends who spend a lot of their time moving around small volumes of liquid by hand? And that's creating a modular research lab that you can just script your protocols instead of physically moving it around yourself and quickly change out, okay, I want to incubate from one hour, one to one hour, one to 45 minutes. I don't have to go in and do it by hand and wait another 45 minutes. I just edit it and hit execute on my computer. It changes the research lab from one where there's pipettes everywhere to a lab that looks exactly like a tech startup. It's just computers. So now I can design and control my experiments all through a web browser. All the information is pulled back automatically, so it's much more easy to analyze. And I can run a vast variety of different experiments without having any capital equipment and quickly change any of them on a whim and then scale it beyond what I could ever do physically. But again, it's, you're not kind of limited to transcriptics approach. There's a lot more available space between gathering information, both clinical and preclinical, uh, and then combining that with software and machine learning to iterate on those designs and experiments uh, automatically. Uh, the third section is reimagining healthcare's interface. So here we have a, a, a sector where at the core of many industries is, a, is the ability to influence people's decisions at the time that they're accessing and going through a portal to access information. Uh, the example in the tech world is the dominance of IBM throughout much of the 20th century. Uh, and they weren't replaced by someone building a slightly better IBM mainframe. They were replaced by someone building an OS layer on top of what was a very complicated piece of machinery that just moved a level up towards the user. And again, Microsoft was eclipsed by Apple moving from desktop to, to a mobile phone. And now you have an ongoing battle on apps and chatbots on top of that layer again. Uh, the analogy in healthcare is all the existing systems that are dominated by really a small number of vendors from large providers, insurance companies, and EHR systems like Epic and Cerner. My bet is that you're unlikely to replace those things by building a slightly better version of them. You're more likely to replace them by building something that seems small or niche or orthogonal to it that ends up redefining how we think about delivering healthcare and how people access healthcare. Uh, and doing that from a patient perspective. An example of this is one of our portfolio companies, 23andMe. Uh, 23andMe delivers, instead of a molecular diagnostic directly to a clinician that they can then talk about with their patient, they deliver it directly to the patient. But that also means thinking about what the patient wants. It's maybe not just your carrier status. It's also your ancestry report, wellness reports, trait reports that are engaging to the patient and make them think about their health in a different way. Uh, and now by focusing on the user at that deep of a level, the engagement rate that 23andMe sees from emails and notifications sent out to their over a million person uh, uh, customer data set is, 
is higher than many of even our direct-to-consumer type businesses. Uh, and that's because of that focus on the user and coming about healthcare in kind of a, a, a different novel way. Uh, and again, that's not just limited to 23's and his approach of building some type of wet lab diagnostic and delivering of people. There's lots of different categories that are available for that same type of orthogonal attack. And that's the, I think about insurance companies, clinical care assistants, physician communities. So in insurance, that's a way of many Americans still access the healthcare system. They go to Blue Cross Blue Shield and look up what physician to go contact. Uh, that experience itself is broken. Uh, they get claims data and their bill back in the mail. Uh, like I have a PhD, I was looking over my brother's uh, medical bill. It's hard to diagnose what that bill even means. That's the main way that the system is communicating back with patients, uh, and it's completely broken. Um, another one is clinical care assistance. So we were talking about this a bit before, but what can patients expect when they, in when they interact with the healthcare system? What to do next? Uh, and the other is physician community. You know, we think not just from the patient's perspective, the other big group in the healthcare industry is physicians. Uh, and often in clinical practices, you're siloed, isolated, and lonely. Uh, where do you get new information from? How do you connect with fellow physicians uh, to work on problems that you're interested in? Uh, and we're just seeing kind of the beginning crop up of these groups that, that connect physicians in, in different ways. Uh, so that was like the really quick high level overview of uh, you know, just like adding in a few buzzwords. We got machine learning in there, we got digital health. Uh, and so looking forward to your questions later, thank you.